He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Today is Resurrection Sunday. In the Christian faith and in the history of the world, this is undoubtedly the most important day in all of human history. Today we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the grave. Uh, you know, we, we like to celebrate Christmas, and it's important because without Christmas, there could be no Easter. Uh, but without Easter, without the resurrection, Christmas has no meaning. So thank God for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that is an accomplished fact. Today, our message title is A Most Unbelievable Thing. And we're going to be reading from the 20th chapter of John, verses 1 through 18. It's quite a few verses, but it's the story of, of Resurrection Sunday. Verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it is still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. <clears throat> Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down, looked in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together, in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting, one at the head and other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Now, when she said this, this sends chills around down my spine. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary, exclamation point in my Bible. She turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. The impossible happened. Early on in the morning of Good Friday, Jesus told his disciples, Remember what I have told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you will be very happy for me, for now I can go to the Father who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happen, so that when they do, you will believe in me. Now, in our lesson, this is Sunday morning. They had seen Jesus brutally beaten and nailed to a cross. They saw him die 
and buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea with guards set in front to ensure that no one could steal the body. Jesus was executed as a common criminal and disposed of as a menace to society. His ragtag group of followers had disbanded and gone into hiding. Only his mother and a few other women were brave enough to approach the tomb in hope of assuring a proper burial for the master they all loved as the Son of God. And of all people that should come, Mary Magdalene, the lowest of the lowly, was the first one brave enough to approach the tomb of her Savior. You see, Mary had been a prostitute. She had been devil-possessed. And by social standards, she would not be a reliable witness anyone would want to believe. Yet, she was the first to experience a most unbelievable thing. The tomb was empty, and there were no guards. What happened here? She ran and found Peter and John, telling them what she had seen. They ran to the tomb and found it empty. Later, Mary looked into the tomb and saw two angels. They asked why she was crying, and her answer was because of grief that someone had taken the body of Jesus away. Now, isn't it interesting that the two disciples went into the tomb and found it empty? But when Mary went in, she saw two angels. Where were those guys? Have you ever wondered why Peter and John did not find any angels, but Mary did? Maybe that thought never crossed your mind before. It really never did until I studied for the message. Why? Well, verses 8 and 9 tell us that John saw the rumpled grave clothes, and he believed that Jesus was risen from the dead. Did you catch that? Peter was astounded, but John, when he saw the grave clothes empty, believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Later, Mary came into the tomb with grief in her heart. The Beacon Bible Commentary makes an interesting comment on these particular facts. It says, The empty grave clothes, which had been sufficient evidence to bring John to an active and achieving faith, had not even caught Mary's attention. It is well to remember that God comes to men in various ways according to their different temperaments and unequal abilities to understand and respond. Thank God for that. In this sense, there is here portrayed a universal gospel. Christ is the risen Lord for all men. That's the picture that is seen in those facts. Mary turned around from the angels, and another most unbelievable thing happened. Jesus stood next to her and asked her why she wept. She did not recognize him, and she supposed him to be the keeper of the garden, and she asked if he had moved the body of Jesus. The empty grave clothes and the angels did not suggest to her that Jesus was risen from the dead. The truth had to come to her in a different way than it did for John. Gently, Jesus simply said to her, Mary, that's what it took. Adam Clark gives his impression of Jesus saying her name. The word was no doubt spoken with uncommon emphasis. And the usual sound of Christ's voice accompanied it, so as immediately to prove that it must be Jesus. What transports of joy must have filled this woman's heart? Let it be remarked that Mary Magdalene sought Jesus more fervently and continued more affectionately attached to him 
than any of the rest. Therefore, to her first, Jesus is pleased to show himself, and she is made the first herald of the gospel of a risen Savior. What a privilege was given to this lowly woman. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is a most unbelievable thing. But it is the one essential thing God had to do to redeem mankind. God created the human race to enjoy perpetual fellowship, fellowship with him and with each other in the beauty of moral perfection. But yet, God gave us free will and the ability to choose that moral perfection or to establish ourselves as our own gods and the determiners of our own fates. History shows us we chose the latter. And all mankind are born into this world in moral depravity and the depths of sin that separate us from the very God that created us and loved us. For over four millennia of history, God dealt with us to show us the total impossibility of our own redemption. And then he set a star in the sky to signify the only answer to our moral and spiritual dilemma. A baby was born in a manger in Bethlehem, but not just a baby. This baby was a most unbelievable thing in that he was the incarnation of the Creator God in a real and natural human being. This human being was called Jesus, the name meaning Savior. At the age of 12, he recognized his identity and divine calling, telling Joseph and Mary that he must be about his father's business. And about 18 years later, his distant cousin, John the Baptist, recognized him and called him the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Truly a most unbelievable thing, but yet the solution to the human sin problem. While Jesus is the incomprehensible God-man, he chose to live a natural human life subjected to all the temptations common to mankind, not relying on his godness, but relying solely on the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit directing his moral compass. We are told in Hebrews 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. While there is much more that can be said about the humanity of Jesus, it is sufficient for us to know that by his taking on the human nature, he was the only one qualified to make atonement for the sins of the world. Jesus is the sinless sacrifice that takes away sin and restores moral purity to the human heart. The Old Testament gives us the history of God's dealing with human sin. God prepared a way to bring about forgiveness of sins, truly repented. This way involved killing of certain animals. Through ceremony and ritual, the sins of vigils were transferred to these innocent animals. You see, these animals were totally innocent and even incapable of committing sin, but yet they died 
so that a person's sin could be forgiven. Jesus came as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus lived a perfect moral life as a real man without committing sin. But he freely chose to take the sin of the entire human race on himself and die as the only one and the only sin sacrifice possible of not just forgiving sin, but actually taking it away from a person's life. These great biblical truths are not merely abstract teachings, but they are real, effective, and they lead to what the unregenerate mind is a most unbelievable thing, which is deliverance from sin and being brought into a right relationship with God. Notice it was Mary Magdalene to whom the resurrected Christ revealed himself first. Well, what is the significance of that? Mary had been a sinner. Not the worst sin ever, but enough sin that she had been brought under the power of evil spirits. And in a way, she represents you and me, all of us. Why? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In that sense, there's no difference between Magnum, Mary Magdalene and you or me. There's no difference between you and me when it comes to that issue. <clears throat> okay? It puts us all on the same level, regardless of how much sin we ever committed or did not commit. Now, this may seem like an unbelievable thing, but is a most encouraging thing to those who seem to have lost hope. What does this fact tell us about the resurrected Christ? It tells us that he, is, he always reveals himself to those that need him the most. And those include every person that lives in this world. When visited by the resurrected Christ, most people have the same problem Mary had. She did not recognize him. No one at first recognizes Jesus when he comes to them. He seems strange, like a gardener that has rearranged the garden of our lives so that things are out of place. Things we once enjoyed and felt good over now seem to trouble our conscience. We perceive that we really are not in control of our lives. And there is something larger than ourselves that has invaded and upset our personal sense of security. Like Mary, we want an answer to what is going on but nothing seems to make sense. At this point, sadly, all too many turn away. But there is that one, and my friend, it can be you today, that will ask for the answer. Mary said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And that is as if you are saying, I want Jesus, but I don't know where to find him. If he is real, and if he really does what the gospel says he does, I want to find him. And at that very moment, Jesus will do for you that which he did for Mary. He simply spoke her name, and she recognized him. Too many remain in and die in sin because they will not listen to Jesus as he calls their names. The voice of Jesus calling your name does two things for you. First, it exposes the fact to you of your sin and your separation from God. Now, this is not a sense of 
judgment or the wrath of God, but a simple acknowledgement of the condition of sin. And second, at the same time, it reveals the love of God for you. God does not want to condemn you in your sin. Instead, he wants to save you from your sin and bring you into a right relationship with him. As soon as Mary heard Jesus speak her name, she knew exactly who he was. She blurted out, Rabboni. Now, that silly sounding word is full of meaning. It is a title given in three forms to the Jewish teachers of the time. The first form of that word is rab, or simply master, and that is the lowliest degree of honor. The next and a little bit higher is rabbi, which means my master, and that is a title of higher honor. And then there is what Mary said, rabboni, meaning my great master, the most honorable of all. In calling Jesus Rabboni, Mary finally recognized that a most unbelievable thing had become the only believable thing in her life. Jesus was truly resurrected from the dead. This alone confirmed everything he had ever taught about God and God's love for all mankind. It confirmed that everything he taught about salvation from sin is real. And it meant that Jesus had really saved her from sin and made her a child of God. Today, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Where do you stand in relation to the resurrected Christ today, right now, at this moment? Are you a Mary Magdalene with a record of sin that separates you from God? Are you a Mary Magdalene that is under conviction and looking to find the answer to your sin problem? Or are you a Mary Magdalene that is now hearing Jesus speak your name. Remember the great truth of the gospel is taught us by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has done his part in making salvation from sin possible for every person on earth, including you. Jesus is the only way to God, the only way to salvation. There is no other way. And what Jesus taught us in John 3.16, as I have just quoted, you are the whosoever. <laughs> As God has done his part for you, you must now do your part and believe this most wonderful thing. Is there anyone listening to this message that really wants to perish? Which means to be separated from God and all that is good for eternity. Is there anyone listening to this message that really wants everlasting life, which means to spend eternity with God and all that is good for eternity. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. This seemingly most unbelievable thing can become the most believable and most wonderful thing in your life. Amen.